You're listening to The Real Short Box, a comic book podcast made for geeks by geeks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Real Short Box. My name is Dr. Kevin, and to my left, it is... Uh, Donald... And across the hall from me is... That would be Darren. And when you say, uh, Donald, we're actually having Butthead from Beavis and Butthead as our guest today. Uh, uh, <laughs> Fire's cool. Uh, Fire's cool. That's, uh, that's like, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Tuesday's taco day. Mmm, I do love tacos. Anyway. Today we are discussing, as a matter of fact, we're going to get into part two of our Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Love Fest. And I appreciate the millions and millions of you that listened to part one. Because you understood that that's the best way to get the info and get the love. We're the best around. No one's ever gonna bring us down. That's Uh-oh. right. That's right. And I can't sing any more than that because uh, they'll take it down off YouTube. Oh! Oh, that's oh. right. We'll get sued. Yeah. Take that, YouTube. See, what we're gonna do is we're gonna discuss the movies that made us so happy as children, as well as the toy figures that made our parents broke. (laughs) (laughs) That is 100% accurate. Yes. I would, I I made $4 and 35 cents every two weeks. I think I've mentioned this before, uh, for doing, uh, my own chores, which is basically feeding my own dog. My parents didn't give me, (laughs) (laughs) that was it. That's what you had to do. Yeah. That's all I had to do. And they gave me that money. So the uh, the four thirty four four thirty five I think I got every two weeks I would buy a figure, and then once I got old enough that they started paying me to wash the dishes I got a dollar each time I did the dishes. Are you serious? Yes. So I could make. What'd you, uh, what'd you, what'd you get for cutting the grass? I didn't cut the grass. I was too allergic. Oh, you're lucky. I tried. You're lucky. But I was miserable. I would sneeze. I had to cut the grass. Eyes of water and shit. I wanted to. We had a riding mower. It would be oh. awesome. Yeah, I'd have rode that bitch all over. Put my headphones on, my Walkman, and boom. I'd have rode that shit. Got more money even, but no. All I could do was the dishes and were feed your, my own damn dog. Were you a raker? Did you rake the leaves? Were you, mm. were you a good raker? We didn't need to. No, they didn't like us to rake the leaves. That wasn't a thing. I, oh we weren't God. weird. Uh, that would compost and then create a fertile land for, for the for the grass to grow. Well, I had a grass pollen allergy myself, but I was just tough and did the lawn. In other words, you're a real man. Yeah, but I also was mowing a quarter of an acre. It's a little different. I'm assuming Donald's plowing fields potentially was, with the amount of property out there. Yeah, several acres of land. Yeah, and you know, uh, to, to quote uh, a certain corporation that we used to work for, I was able to connect... <laughs> Uh, with my mother before I came over here, and she reminded me of all the good old days of where all those toys came from, and it was primarily from my grandmother who was uh, collecting Social Security, but always had an extra couple of dollars to make sure we had a nice action figure. So. Oh, sweet grandma. Absolutely. Yeah, and those figures were pretty sweet. They weren't bad. They were pretty... They, I'm going to say this right now. They were not He-Man bullshits. While He-Man was cool, don't get me wrong, and the muscles and everything... Uh, He-Man and G.I. Joe had the rubber band things in their chest and in their arms and stuff. And after a while, if you were too aggressive, they would snap and break. Or they would just dry rot and break. And then, uh, you know, that's no fun. But wouldn't that be the fault of the child and not the manufacturer? No. Okay. Okay. Now that we've got that settled. Yeah, toys were meant to be played with. Right. So the Ninja Turtle ones, they would last much longer. And the worst thing you could do is cave in their head or something or pull it off because it was a little, you know, more rubbery. But the bodies were harder plastic, and they, they were sturdy. I Like, the things those Ninja Turtles did to April O'Neil, and she survived it. Wow. Yeah, well, they would throw her places off the cliff and, like, throw her into the turtle van. and. Okay. I don't know. What, what, what were you thinking? I don't know what you were thinking. What were you thinking, you pervert? I, I... J- just remember, kids, when you grow up, those toys, you will still collect them, but in a box. And you will never remove them from the box in order to maintain and preserve them. Unless you are a loser. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't need to point out that I have a lot of Ninja Turtle figures (laughs) just sitting around. I mean, you know. But the thing is, though, yours are out of the box because you you had a justified reason to take them out. You were under the age of 10. (laughs) 
Now, unacceptable. Well, I mean, this, the, look, just because they go in the same bed with me at night doesn't mean that anything weird's going on. It just means I want to make sure they're protected and do well you, taken care of. Do you take well, them to the bathtub with you as well? Uh, like only a rub, like, like a rubber ducky. Only Ace Duck, because okay. he's a duck. Okay. You know, okay. this this is the moment in our podcast where we discover that certain people need dates. <laughs> that is absolutely correct. Oh, wah, wah. and we are proud of it. All right, so the 1988 line of Ninja Turtle figures, that was the first line that came out. Uh, That had uh, April O'Neil, Bebop, Rocksteady, uh, a foot soldier, which those were kind of crappy. Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, um, Donatello, and then the two baddie baddies, uh, Shredder, and then the goody-goody Splinter. Well, yeah, and what's important about those two, that would just be considered your basic assortment of the 88 line. Mm-hmm. Which I I have all of those. Now, granted, they weren't all for me specifically. Brag, I have other brother. brothers. I have other brothers. So, you know, over time, we just collected a whole bunch of them. And didn't Playmates produce those uh, figures? Uh, yeah, they did. They did. Playmates did um, produce those. <laughs> One of the weirdest ones, I thought, was... Uh, I always thought the Rat King was kind of weird, but I like yeah. the figure. Uh, Leatherhead was weird. Uh, when they came out with Krang, they put Krang in the little tiny uh, dome with the the little arms and legs, the little suit. You know, that came out in, in 89. Uh, then they had Genghis Frog, who I think, wasn't he like the surfer dude or whatever? He totally yeah, was. He totally yeah. was. Whoa, like, oh, man, or like the skateboarder or something, I think. One, he was either the surfer or skateboarder. I couldn't remember which. Then they did Baxter Stockman, which as the fly, which that was always cool because you could put the snap the wings in or something, or these extra hands or something. No, you, you could, could you could snap the wings in, and what was really nice about that is that was a little ahead of its time uh, for action figures. And I really liked the quality of these. You'd get some paint chippage and stuff, but to break them, I mean, you really would have to try. Yeah, you'd have to throw them pretty hard, stick a cherry bomb on their back. And uh, put them up on the roof and scare the birds. And... Is that what you did one Fourth of July? I'm not saying I did. No. Um, I remember also they had the Super Swim and Donatello, which I thought was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. You put them in the water, and that was the one you could put in the bathtub. He had a wind up thing, and then he would paddle, and he had like a I don't know what it was in the front. It was like a little jet thing that in the cartoon would he you would go down the the sewer with. And so, you know, when you had him in the tub, he would just swim around, and it was pretty cool. Yeah, a personal favorite figure of mine that I really was happy to own, uh, other than the Casey Jones, was I thought the Usagi Yojimbo was really neat, Um, especially just, Mm -hmm. like, the coloring, uh, the shoulder pads. I mean, all that, I just, I really kind of dug that figure. Uh, That's a personal favorite of mine. Um, But I tell you, let me tell you the story of this guy, Adam. And I'm not going to say what his last name is. And you would think that I'd be over this after roughly, gee, I don't know, 31 years. 31 years. But you know what? Where I'm from, we hold grudges. And that's just the way it goes. Okay. So let me tell you about this guy, Adam. My God, he's pouring a drink to tell this story. Yep. It's happening. And who is Adam, you wonder? Let me tell you what kind of a person this Adam is. This is the kind of person... Who let's let's think about this. When you're a young kid, ten dollars is a lot of money. Ten dollars is an afternoon at the uh, at the local fair that we would go to, you know, before school started. Adam for ten dollars, I kid you not, went from one baseline to another baseline on a basketball court with his tongue on the floor. He legitimately licked the floor. From baseline to baseline for ten dollars. This is the kind of guy this person was when he was a young kid. Gotcha. So let me t- explain to you what this person did to me. What did he do? This person messed my Leo up, stole my Leonardo. Mm-hmm. Actually, drew X's on the eyes. That's a crime. And I was very upset, and I was very discouraged as a kid from starting fights with people. So, what someone very kind, so of course my parents said, uh, you know, just just be polite about it and stuff. Then I got advice from somebody else who remained nameless, and they said, are you bigger than them? Yeah. Okay. Well, say that I want a new figure, and that'll be that. You know, like, just, I'm not going to fill in the blanks here, but let's just say it's full of rage. And 
walk in the next day. And I was literally, my mouth was just about to open and said, hey, uh, do you mind if I, I keep your Leo? And I said, if you want to breathe, you will not do that. He said, I got gotcha. you. I, how about you have this one? Very kindly gave me one in a box. As perfect as could be, brand new Leo. And I'm really glad I didn't pelt that kid because I wouldn't have a nice, fresh, brand new Leonardo. What was his name again? Adam. Adam. Adam, you piece of shit. We're coming for you. Oh, I, oh yes. We, we'll share the last name when we're off record. And it's not because I like this person. It's because we need to avoid libel prosecution. All right. I got something here. Here's another. Here's a good story for you. Um, when I was younger, we used to pretend to be Ninja Turtles. I was Donatello, of course. My friend Patrick was uh, uh, Leonardo. And uh, then we had a mutual friend. May he rest in peace. His name is Johnny Reynolds. And uh, he's passed a while ago. And he was Raphael. And then uh, we had one more person play Michelangelo. And I can never remember who that was, who played Michelangelo. I think it might have been Greg. Um, but that was only once in a while. But we did have a guy named uh, named Brian. And Brian, well, Shane also, Shane played uh, usually played Splinter. But uh, we, Brian never knew he was part of this game, by the way. Let me, let me state that fact. He was the Shredder. Hmm. Um, and we would torment this kid on the playground, regardless of whether he knew he was the Shredder or not, simply because he was the Shredder to us. He, we would chase him around. We would get him in headlocks and give him nuggies and, and push him back and forth. And so you guys stuff. were bullies, basically. But we weren't, though. Here's the thing. We were the biggest nerds in the world back then. Nerds could be bullies. And, and we were bullying just a slightly bigger nerd than us. That was the only thing. Mm. So it was like the bullied became a bully only temporary when we were turtles. Mm. We were turtle bullies. I see. It was weird, but we did it. So, Brian, I apologize. I know we're not friends on Facebook or anything, or I don't think we are. Um, and, and I'm sorry that we pushed you around all those times yeah, on the playground. But family. to be fair, it was socially acceptable in that time to do that. It, not, right. Not now. And, and also, to be fair, that was probably one of the highlights of Johnny's life. So, um, you know, we, we led him to something good there for that moment. So I see. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, he will not have his vengeance upon you. Br uh, Brian? I'm not scared of Brian. So, okay. Kevin, why don't you tell us the stories of how you used to juggle the action figures? I did no such thing. <laughs> I showed respect to the action figures. I treated them as prized possessions. From what I heard from your sisters, you would put birdseed in your mouth, and you would get you would get Ace Duck and have him peck inside your mouth. You would put the figure's head in your mouth, and when your sisters would be like, you're weird, you'd be like, he's eating! Yeah, that's not, that that's not what food. I heard. That's not what I I heard he used to have tea parties with them. Oh, tea parties with creepy crawl and splinter? <laughs> you know, sometimes you can learn a lot from a tea party. And Don the undercover turtle? Yeah, you can learn a lot from a tea party. Ah, see, yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely could. <laughs> oh, or, or is that a Mark Meadows reference? Yes. It okay. was rock and roll Michelangelo you used to hang out with. Yes. Next to the wacky walking Mauser. Yes. Yeah, they had some names here. Let's just go down the names real quick of some of this nonsense here. We had... Leo the Sewer Samurai, Mike the Surfer, the, the sewer sa uh, surfer, Mondo Gecko, Muckman, and Joe Eyeball. By the way, Muckman and Joe Eyeball were creepy as hell. Oh, and here's some interesting facts, considering this is my segment. Um, we have, I've managed to find for you the three most valuable action figures. Tell me, tell me. Okay. All right, so number three is a 1-6 scale Bebop and Rocksteady from the fall of 2017. goes for $600. $600. Oh, I think tw you said 20, 2017 or 16? 2017 fall. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, They did a run. It, it might have been the Mondo run, huh? May have been the Mondo run. Yeah. The number two would be Undercover Raphael. There was a run of undercover uh, turtles. It's interesting. They had a very famous one with Donatello. Right. But this specific one came out in 1994. Uh, had a cloth jacket, which was kind of unusual for an action figure like that. Uh, a fedora came with additional spy accessories, which Ooh. is really fun. Such as the undercover mutant, uh, mutant Mori camera, infrared goggles, 
eavesdropping dish, the surveillance spy case, the private eye pistol, and the ninja spy size. <laughs> I spy with my little sigh. Someone to slice. <laughs> and this comes in at a value of $700, gentlemen. But wow. there is only one, and like my buddy Chris Lambert would say, there can be only one, and that is Scratch the Cat. Scratch the Cat? Scratch the Cat. remember that at all. came out I. in 1993. It was one of the last action figures created in the original toy line. Um it uh it, it's interesting out of box this will go for $200 in a box though cuz it's the hardest thing to complete your collection it will go for $1200 1200 oh smackaroos scratch the cat wow i've never heard of that uh, so donald i i'm really curious let, let, i want to talk about these movies because obviously we have great memories and they're they were relatively popular and there were some sorry, famous I'm people in those movies currently looking at a picture of scratch the cat Oh, is yeah. disturbing you that much? He looks well. He looks like the cat from uh, the Paula Abdul song, "Opposites <laughs> Attract." Right? <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Looks like that cat, but only in a prison outfit. Hmm. And it's just scratch. It's a uh, jailbird, the the swindling sidekick, bag of burgled loot, criminal cake gun, and felonous fish club were his weapons. His favorite government employee, the dog catcher, and favorite breakfast cereal was mouse granola. Here's the story of Scratch. He's been sentenced to nine life terms. <laughs> of course. Of course. Busted nine out of jail terms. nine times. Of course. Now this flea-bitten feline is free to frolic with the fetid foot clan. Jesus. Scratch is the meanest street cat you're likely to meet, and if you perchance to run into this mutant mongrel, run him over before he scratches you senseless. But beware, because <laughs> Scratch is the master of trickery. That's how he gets out of jail all the time. He may fool the fuzz by offering them a piece of his criminal cake gun, then it's swipe, swipe, and Scratch is off running, and his swindling sidekick, Jailbird. Together, they torment and terrorize the teens by bumping off banks and teaming up with Shredder. Scratch has got his felonous fish club, too, to batter up the turtle teens, and no matter how he flips to fight, Scratch always lands on his feet. So don't cr cross Scratch's path, or he'll cross you out. Boy, that was terrible. I can see why they were just running out of ideas on these figures. And what, what was the source material you read that from, sir? It looks terrible. Um, it's uh, the Turtlepedia site. Uh, they have a whole list of all the figures and stuff. And this was actually listed on, most likely, under the bio on the back of the box. Which is what they used to have the turtle bios listed. And you would cut those out if you didn't want to keep the box. Right. And one of these days, um, we might look into the future of doing a podcast um, about the Star Wars action figures that I have. And one thing that I can say is... In reference to Scratch the Cat, the odds and ends figures oftentimes are the most expensive and mm -hmm. the hardest to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm about to come over to your house and take those from you. Well, they're not currently at my house. They will be, but I ain't going to tell you when. And the box will be electrified. Oh, no. All right, so let's talk about some Ninja Turtle movie time. Some Ninja Celluloid. Now, let me tell you something here. This movie was so popular that when I went to see it, we had to wait into a line around the block. 1990. Wow. It was that popular. It came out in 1990, directed by Steve Barron. Okay. It was huge. At this point, the fever of the, the cartoon, the fever of the, the comic books were at a fever pitch and the toy line it was it was insanity yes and turtle the toy mania line was, everything was dominating the nation that's exactly what they call it turtle mania yes um the whole thing the the script was based on the early teenage mutant Ninja turtle comics including the stories of the turtles origins rooftop battle um sojourn to the farmhouse and the battle with shredder elements were taken from the 1980s animated series such as the turtles color bandanas and love of pizza Elements of Michelangelo's character in April O'Neil as a television reporter instead of a lab assistant. And it had a dark tone, too. Yep. Here's This is great, guys. The film's budget? Just guess. What do you think the film's budget is? $13 million. Was? Um, God, I'd say probably about, about seven. 13.5. Ah, uh, ding, 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 Still ding. relatively low budget. Yeah, still relatively low budget, even for 1990. Much of the production took place in North Carolina with a couple of locations in New York City during the summer of 89 to capture famous landmark areas such as Times Square and Empire State Building and the Hudson River. Um, took place in uh, North Carolina Film Studios. 
where New York rooftop sets were created, production designer Roy Forge Smith and his art director Gary Wisner went to New York City four months prior to filming and took still photographs so they could build this set. Crazy, and, right? And you know what's what's what always kind of is interesting to me about this movie, you really don't have a lot of named actors. If you could if you really broke it down, Corey Feldman as the voice of Michelangelo might be the number one well known actor at that mm-hmm. time. Yep. Yeah, uh, you, you played Sorry. Donatello? Okay, yeah, oh. he was he was Donatello. Oh, he was Donatello. Okay, yeah. Mike. See, I, I haven't got to this in a while because I wanted to ask you guys another question about this movie because I haven't seen it in an eternity. eternity. It's sitting on a shelf. Right. But Raphael was a real kind of like asshole a jerk. What's the word I'm looking for? He he was very hormonal. Um, yeah. Is that accurate to his character in any of the books or the cartoons? Because I don't quite recall I don't that. Don't that either. In in the comic book, in the Archie comic book, and in the cartoon series, Raphael was great particularly because he was sarcastic and fun. Mm-hmm. He was a wisecracker. Mm-hmm. And and that I loved about him. The only thing I didn't like about him was his weapons. Sure. Like, if he had the bow staff, I probably would have preferred him over Donatello, to be honest. I agree. And, and only because I love that personality. And when the movie came out, they made him kind of the, the, the leader. Mm-hmm. And they also made him real hard, like mean and kind of nasty and not very fun. Mm-hmm. Very serious. And I don't, I don't know, I, I don't remember that being part of Mirage. I could be wrong, but it just did, it didn't work for me. I didn't like that. But I did like his uh, his fight scene with Casey Jones in the movie. I thought that was great that was in, cool. the, in the park there. I thought that was really well done. Now here's another tidbit of this. A lot of studios: Walt Disney, Columbia Pictures, MGM, Orion, Paramount, even Warner Brothers, all turned down the film for distribution. But we, but we know who didn't turn it down. Yep. Who didn't turn it down, Kevin? New Line Cinema. You got it. New Line Cinemas, which was a... The, the house that Freddy Krueger built. Yep, well, exactly. W- would Warner Brothers have owned New Line at that time? Um, I don't think they no, had it just I, yet. I don't think Not they yet. did. Um, according to Brian Henson, the film was finished in post-production, largely without Baron. Editor Salas Menke, who later edited many films by Quentin Tarantino, was removed as production company Golden Harvest did not like her work. So it was the production company Golden Harvest that sold it for distribution to New Line Cinema to be put out in theaters. And boy, did they take off. They had a marketing thing, Live Entertainment, announced that the film would go to a VHS via its family home entertainment label uh, on October 4th in 1990. Suggested price was $24.99. Pizza Hut engaged in a $20 million marketing campaign tied into the film. Oof. $20 million because of the love of pizza in the film. In 1990, I remember the Nintendo geez. game had the Pizza Hut advertisements in it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, on the film's initial release, uh, Entertainment Weekly gave the movie an F rating, finding that none of the four Turtles or Splinter had any personality and felt that a young audience might enjoy the film, noting that the reviewer might have gone for it too hard. I had been raised on Nintendo games and a robotic animation that passes for entertainment on today's Saturday morning TV. Um, but he found the characters reminiscent of the early 70s Godzilla film. So there was a lot of... Uh, Venom being spit towards the movie from some of the critics. You but know, it didn't I, work. I recall um, mm-hmm. Roger Ebert gave it roughly about a C plus or a B minus. Um, so there were elements he definitely liked, but I, I mean, I thought the tone of the movie was unusual. It took a second to really get used yeah. to it. What does Siskel say? Uh, I don't recall what Siskel I said. I just go to RogerEbert.com. See, there, <laughs> there's my plug. So, so what we're gonna do here is. Uh, <laughs> We're going we're gonna to realize very shortly that when the movie came out, it was number one in the box office. Right. Mm-hmm. It raked in $25 million. Amazing for that time. Yep, over Especially the weekend. That budget. Film turned out to be a huge success, eventually making over $135 million in more North America and over 66 overseas. So almost a $200 million movie for a $13.5 million budget. Yes. Impressive. Making it the ninth highest grossing film of 1990 worldwide. The film was also nominated for awards by the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films. Uh, the VHS reached number four in the home video market and was released by DVD in September 3rd, 2002. Um, it spawned immediately. Uh, a sequel was, was greenlit then. And uh, the sequel a year later came out, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze, it was released in theaters. Famous soundtrack. Huge commercial success. Yeah. Huge. 
Yeah, and you know what, guys? I, I like the sequel. A lot of it's sentimental value to me. Um, my grandmother, who I mentioned earlier, just on basically living on her social security, took uh, her, took myself and my three brothers. It's one of my fond memories well, when she took us uh, to Regal's Cinema South. And uh, that was just a very enjoyable thing. And I don't care. I like Toka and Razor. Yeah. And uh, Ernie Ray's Jr., being outside of the costume and, and being uh, his regular human form as the pizza delivery guy, great choice. I thought yeah. he had a lot of uh, he had a lot of uh, of good energy, good vibes. He seemed like you know he was very eager. And I met him wasn't last year it was in 2017. I met him at a uh, screening for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles too, hmm. uh, and uh, in, in Hollywood at the Chinese Theater. And he was great. He was great. I got my picture taken with him. And we talked for a little bit. He was a very nice guy, very and, scholar and a gentleman. And how did you feel about it when uh, when he, you asked him to do the ninja rap? Oh, he would have been all for that. Have done that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we did strike poses like Ninja Turtles. I did ask if we could do that. And he was like, yeah, sure. That's good to hear, actually, you know, because most people, you know, they there's a, a thing where they get harassed all the yeah. time. And I and understand they don't that. do it. Yeah, I understand that because it might set a press. But you know what? You got to go where the uh, where where your career took you. Like, we remember you. You should be very pleased by that. Like it's RoboCop. Fun. Oh, absolutely. Uh, who played RoboCop? Uh, that'd be Peter Weller. Yeah. Yes, Peter, Peter Weller. Weller does not like to talk about RoboCop anymore. Why is that? Because he's done with it. He's over it. He's talked about it a million times. He doesn't want... It's his most successful thing he's ever done in his life, and he doesn't want to deal with it anymore. He wants to put that to bed. He wants to put it behind him. Uh, the only reason why he came to this event that I was at to talk about RoboCop uh, before the screening of RoboCop was because someone uh, from the movie had passed, and he wanted to... Um, give a little memorandum memorium thank you memorium of uh of the person that had passed uh in the film so it was very nice of him to do that but you could tell he was very much over that film you know he has a resemblance to ed harris or he does he just sounds a little more like this i guess so yeah i would say he's got a bigger uh, head than ed harris what, what were your thoughts on secret of the ooze kevin I just remember that ninja rap from uh, Vanilla Ice. Go ninja, go ninja, go, go ninja, go ninja, go ninja, ninja rap. Go ninja, go, go, go. Oh, so much fun! So by much one, fun. By one Rob Van Winkle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, Rob Van Winkle. Yeah, and then they did a. Um, well, that had the second one had Super Shredder in it too. Yes, remember? It did. Who was played by Kevin Nash? Yeah, That's what a right. beast! Oh, my God. God, good Lord, that man. And that was that was a really cool thing because in the trailer I think they showed it and we were like everybody all the kids were like whoa well, check it out Super Shredder oh my god that was like I waited for that figure I waited for that figure and I never got that figure I waited and waited and waited and waited what I did get was the Krang giant robot that he got in uh huh that he would walk around in I got that beast. And that was awesome. You put Krang in that, and there was no stopping that something. <laughs> you, you had to have the turtle blimp, but guess what? I couldn't afford it. So instead, I got the uh, the pizza shooter, I believe is what okay. it was called. <laughs> and they would shoot giant pizzas at Krang and eventually knock him over. And I don't want to misspeak here. About how tall was that cyborg action figure? About a foot. I would say uh, yeah. about 12 to yeah. 14 inches, yeah. I would say. Okay. Yeah. It was pretty big. It was a big figure. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty awesome. I still have it at home, too. I got a big <laughs> trunk at home filled with all my Ninja Turtle figures. Oh, Everything. Wow. Ninja Raphael shaped uh, Ninja Turtle bowl. Uh, Michelangelo Ninja T Turtle shaped spoons. Uh, Ninja Turtle t shirts. Ninja Turtle stuffed toys. I got a Leonardo in my bedroom, right? <laughs> right as we speak. Uh, in. in Los Angeles, California. I have a Leonardo Ninja Turtle in my bedroom, and I ain't shy about it. But since it is Wet Blanket Tuesday, do you have Scratch the Cat? <laughs> no, I don't have Scratch the Cat. Oh, sorry to interrupt, everyone. Just wanted to mention real quick about a shop in Canoga Park, California called Spiro's Heroes. Elliot, the proprietor of the store, has over 300,000 books in what's called the Temple of Comics. That's Spiro Heroes in Canoga Park. SpiroHeroes.com. I don't even think I would have liked him when I was younger, to be honest. Looking at the figure, he looks like a cartoon. Like, that just a skate. You know what I mean? He just, he just looks too cartoony, you, even for the Ninja Turtles. Do you have a bias against cats? Do you have prejudice against the feline? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Okay. The I only don't. good cat's a dead cat. 
<laughs> okay, there you go. Well, I don't like cats. I've been very uh, honest about that. I think cats are pretty mean. Well, that's because if you incite them to meanness, then they're going to be mean. No, they're just mean in general. Usually to me, for no reason whatsoever. When it comes to pets, I want to buy love. I don't want to work for it. There that's, we go. I see. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, so then Ninja Turtles 2 was a huge success. Ninja Turtles 3 came out. It was Turtles in Time, mm. basically. Uh, not a very good movie, but the one thing that did make it amazing was they brought Casey Jones back. Played by who, Darren? Uh, that would be Elias Cotius. Elias Cotius played Casey Jones in the first movie and in the third movie. He was amazing. Uh, he was great in that. Uh, he brought the fun to the third movie that was lacking because there was a little bit of uh, some weirdness in, in the time travel and stuff that just didn't work. Plus, in the second and third movie, we had a different uh, April O'Neil as well, a different actress playing April O'Neil than had played her in the first. She definitely did not look as April O'Neil-ish as the first actress. Why did they replace her? I don't know, to be honest. I feel like you shouldn't have asked that question. Just Damn like it. on Facebook, Kat, <laughs> Just like on Facebook, it's complicated. Oh. Yes, yes. She left the series actually because she was being harassed. Now, I, I have to. Admit, I made that up. I have no idea. I, I have to admit something uh, on this podcast uh, because I imagine no one wants to spend more time on Turtles in Time. I did not see the 2007 animated Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and I'm very curious what your thoughts were on it. Ah, uh, fun but forgettable. Okay. Yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, there was a big fight between Leonardo and Raphael that was great, mm -hmm. uh, and you know it was all animated, computer animated. Uh, they had a, a rooftop fight in the rain, and I loved it. That was great. Um, the storyline itself was a little bit out there. <laughs> I was saying that about the turtles. <laughs> but it was a little bit out there, and I was like, ah, it's kind of a reach, guys. But it was okay. I, I was just glad that they brought something out for it. You know, it was the fourth film, and I was excited. Um, then the reboots came. The Megan Fox one? Is that any good? I never watched it. Without Scratch the Cat. No. I mean, it would have been better with Scratch the Cat. <laughs> the, the first Michael Bay produced Ninja Turtles movie was garbage. The, you know, when I look at the design, there was potential there in terms of just like the, the concept uh, of the CGI and things of that nature. But I would agree with you. I, I can't remember one thing from that movie other than I just really didn't like it. It was jumbled. It was very confusing. Uh, it was just, yeah, I, I, that's the two best words a, for it. Been a little too jacked, the turtles. Yeah, they're a little too big. A little too big, and they they look at... I don't like the look of them, to be honest. I, I much prefer the more fun look, but, I guess. But that film made so much money that they did the sequel. And I wasn't looking forward to the sequel, but I know when they had Krang in it, I'm like, okay, I gotta give it a look. I've got to give it a look. The, the sequel, the, anime, the uh, Michael Bay sequel, the Out of the Shadows, was definitely better. Uh, although Stephen Amell, um, he's got... I don't think the man has much range, to be honest. And hate me if you want. Um, I think Green Arrow is lacking because of that. I, I've, I've never felt Green Arrow was a strong series on the WB because of the fact that... Or on the, sub, the CW, I mean, because of the fact that there there isn't much range on the lead. Um, so for me, he's a very one-note. So when they announced him as Casey Jones, I was like, eh. Well, one thing that I definitely will agree with you upon is... Um, Arrow is not the best of those CW, WB series, but it did, it was laying the groundwork and ultimately the conceptual look for a number of CW series that came down the line. Yeah, no, I mean, it opened the door, which I'm happy for. It may open a door to Ted Corey. Uh, I think more or less it's a lot of the, the writing's not, to me, it's not the best. Either, so I would, I, I think the writing could be improved That's upon That's why I should hire you, sir. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm making my pitch right now. I'll, I'll send it in. Yeah, that moment that that he did not kill the name is escaping me right now. Uh, the original um, supervillain that he did not kill the one person he didn't kill in the first two seasons. Um, oh, um, shoot! Are we talking about uh, Raj Al Ghul? It wasn't Raj Al Ghul. It was the person who killed his mother. Oh, Merlin. Yeah, Merlin. Merlin. It's yeah. like, dude, you got to kill him. That's the one justified kill. But anyway. I'm yeah. rambling. Right, right. And we were still talking about Arrow, by the way. So getting back to the Ninja Turtles, uh, the new Michael Bay reboots were not very good. Uh, they are talking about a new film. Uh, uh, February 5th, just recently, 
uh, Nickelodeon revealed that they are developing a film adaptation of the 2018 TV series Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is set to be released on Netflix. It marks the second Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles film to be animated, as well as the first film in the franchise without being theatrically released. And, you know, it's kind of interesting to me, too. And I love that Nickelodeon owns this property. Yeah, and Viacom and, brought it, bought it. And, and I wish them the best. And the reason I say that is because I'd like to see a new perspective that's not a Disney perspective or a Warner Brothers perspective. So I hope they can finally get it right because if they don't, they're going to eventually be pressured to sell this property off. That's you're correct. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, th- I think... I think with that, we've, we've gone over, uh, kind of glazed over as well as we could in the time we had the Ninja Turtles. Did you guys have any last things you wanted to mention about this? Yeah, I think Scratch the Cat owes us money. Yes, I agree. Master Splinter is a wise man. Yep, he made a funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did that in the first and second one, and then they were like, that's old, we're done. Yeah. So, um... With that, uh, thank you for listening. Please check us out on uh, iTunes. YouTube. YouTube, yes. Instagram, uh, Facebook. Please subscribe and leave comments of love. Yeah, go to the go to our podcast host website, rumblespoon.com, and leave some love there. Or check out some of the other work they've got going on there as well. You no, know, and it, when you make comments, you can ask us questions, or we will have a very civil, polite debate with you if you'd like to. Yeah. Um, there's just there's so many things we really are passionate about this and would love to hear your thoughts. You, you can even cuss out Dom if you like. And, and if you don't like, maybe we can see you at the comic shop. This has been The Real Short Box. We'll see you at the comic shop. Thanks for listening.